something to muse upon. Um, <laughs> do you think that, assuming that M is different to M dashed, uh, this is the same object as that? What is the symbol in front of the object? Uh, it's the number two. A rose <laughs> <line. laughs> anyway, do you think it's the Minkowski metric? Right? Yeah. Um, do you think that's the same object as that? M dashed isn't N. But what's the if M dashed isn't N, I'd say they're not the same. They're not. You just happen to use the so uh, That's 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 right. They're not. Um, <laughs> 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 really, what one should sort of sub superscript or something, if you're being really strict, because what is a metric? It's a function that's defined on the manifold. So you can't have the very same function defined on a different manifold. It's not the same function, right? Now we don't care about that because what we're really caring about here is the form of the metric, right? And the form of the metric is the same on the two manifolds. Um, so it's a bit of um, Mathematical hygiene, uh, and there's another bit. Um, who thinks that this is okay? Diffeomorphism H, manifold M, let me write HM. Think it's okay? I'm sure you do, because it was in your talk. <laughs> uh, well, I, I thought it was okay too, um, but I had it written in the previous version of this talk. And the mathematicians present said, this doesn't make any sense. They, they really strongly objected to this. Um, so I said that by way of background because um, the thing that prompted me to write this paper was the um, recent line that's been taken by Mike Shulman and um, John Doherty, I think is here, but I don't know, um, who kindly sent me his paper. Um, according to which, if we do things in homotopy type theory, we get rid of the whole argument, and potentially, you know, this ramifies into other areas of um, where, where we get problem problematic interpretive issues arising from an abuse of notation or not being properly mathematically hygienic or whatever. And so, the question that I'm addressing is whether or not it's indeed true that if you do things in homotopy type theory, you block the whole argument, whether it somehow solves the problem. Um, now, uh, I got a lot of slides and not very much time, um, so let's see how we get on. I, 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 I mean, I'm going immediately after Oliver, um, whose title was why we don't need any more talks about the whole argument. So if he's right, then um, it would be good if I spend lots of time on one, um, and then we won't be wasting time talking about the whole argument. But I only really want to talk about one to say enough about it to be able to assess the issue. Um, but it should be of independent interest. And apologies to those who've heard this talk once or more times before. Um, but though, I have changed my mind. Uh, and probably will again. Right. So, all acknowledgement to the wonderful Leakian Trust and the wonderful Stuart Presnell. Um, I've been working on homotopy type theory with him. So let me say a little bit about homotopy type theory. Uh, and I subscribe to the view according to which pretty much everything that we say in philosophy is either false uh, or trivial. And um, what I'm saying here about pot uh, is hopefully trivial from a sort of mathematical point of view, but it's only trivial post hoc. It's really hard to work out how this theory is supposed to work from the official presentations. So um, if you find this all incredibly clear and simple and straightforward, um, it's actually non-trivial to, to get to that point. Anyway, it's a constructive dependent type theory. It's intentional. I'll explain what these things mean. The basic components of, of a type theory are what we call types and tokens. The really important thing is that if we think of types as roughly kinds of things that a mathematical entity could be, then we have a type of natural numbers, we have a type of Lorentzian manifolds, we have 
whatever types we want to talk about. In this theory, um, there's no question of having something on this side of the colon and not knowing what's on the other side of the colon. That is, when anything is introduced, it's introduced as the token of some type. You can't sort of wonder what type it belongs to. Uh, we can also have types of the type of isomorphisms <coughs> between uh, two other types. And this gives us an interpretation. We can, in, we, we can make an, an association between types and propositions and between the tokens of types and something like witnesses or certificates to the truth of the corresponding proposition. So, in particular, if n is the type of natural numbers, it corresponds to the proposition that there's, there is a natural number. And then any particular natural number witnesses the truth of that proposition. And if we're talking about the type of isomorphisms, then it corresponds to the proposition that the two types are isomorphic. And then any token of this type is a particular isomorphism between the two types in question. Okay, now, um, moving along, um, the rules of the theory tell you how to generate complex types from simple ones and so on. And the great thing about this framework is that it doesn't have any independent <coughs> background logic. So one of the first things that people ask when you tell them about Hoth is, Okay, but what's the background logic? Is it first order logic? Is it second order logic? What? And, and the answer is there isn't a background logic. Logic is built into the theory. So, um, in fact, I want to test this on some students sometime. Um, you could teach logic through homotopy type theory ab initio, I think. You, you, they, could, they could know nothing about propositional or predicate logic, and you could just teach it this way. Okay, now, um, I've said all that. So there's rules of type formation, blah, blah, blah. This is the really, I mean, none of this will be that important to what I'm going to say later. I'll, I'll flag up the stuff that is really important. But I wanted to tell you a bit about to be type theory. So, so this is the fundamental thing about it, the curry hot powered correspondence. What it basically hinges upon is the identification of function application with <coughs> modus ponens. Um, so, you know, if I've got a function from type A to type B, uh, what that means is that if you give that function a token of type A, it will give you back a token of type B. And then if you interpret the types in terms of propositions, what that tells you is that if you know the truth of the proposition A, and you've got a function from A to B, then you get to infer the truth of the proposition B. So we represent um, products, uh, we represent conjunction with product types, and disjunction with coproduct types, and we have existential quantification and universal quantification and identity. Um, this, this will be important, and this is a slightly misleading notation, uh, but it's the standard one. So what that dependent <coughs> pair is, um, it's the pair that consists of a token X of type A together with the, a token of the proposition that says, the, the type that represents the proposition that says that X has property P. Okay? So um, if you think about it in terms of predicates, then um, to say that, to have the dependent pair type is, um, and, and say that something has some property, is to have both, let's say, natural numbers and pr primeness, right? Then the dependent pair type would be, consist of the pairs of the number three <coughs> together with the proof that three is prime. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over lots of stuff. The theory is intentional. Uh, I think that makes it really interesting for philosophy of physics. Um, but I'm not going to say much about that here, or anything here, actually. Um, now, product types are primitive in this theory, and um, the identity conditions for products are, as you'd expect, um, the product, the, the, the pair AB will be equal to the pair CD if A equals to C, B is equal to D. So, for products, 
Identity is just pairwise or however many wise. But that's not true for dependent pairs, and that would be really important for us. So what is not true for dependent pairs? The identity is uh, pairwise, right? So if you have a dependent pair, then uh, the pair, one pair can be equal to another pair, even if the individual components of each pair are not equal. In particular, the second component doesn't have to be equal. I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, so, there's a question about what hop really is. As, as uh, I've talked about it so far, I've, I've been talking about Martin Love type theory. And then to that, we can add something called the univalence axiom, which was introduced by Vladimir Vavodsky. Um, now, Vavodsky and other people, some other people, think that what's really important about HOT is the univalence axiom. And that if we have univalence in some other theory, it sort of got all the essential features of HOT. Um, maybe that's not right. Maybe the, the, the standard presentation of HOT in terms of Martin Love type theory is what HOT is, and another theory is just another theory that happens to have univalence. So there's a lot of uh, confusion really about what should count as hot and in the hot book there's uh, little clarity about when something depends on univalence and when it doesn't and that's fundamental to the point that I want to make today um, that my point will be one of my points will be that insofar as hot solves or deals with the whole argument it can do so quite independent of univalence and so it's not really univalence and shouldn't be thought of as a thing that's doing the work. Okay, so I'm trying to speed up so you can um, discuss. So what, what univalence says is very interesting. And very roughly it says that isomorphism is isomorphic to identity. And that's taken by Steve Audi to uh, represent or instantiate mathematical structuralism. And the idea is something like... Mathematical objects simply are structures. The criterion of identity for structures is isomorphism, so we should adopt univalence because then the criterion of, I, of then, then isomorphism is sort of promoted to identity. Um, but that's a bit misleading uh, because actually, if you formulate univalence in terms of isomorphism as standardly defined, um, what you get is inconsistent. Uh, which is bad. Uh, so, in fact, the, the correct notion of uh, the, the correct ingredient into uh, univalence is equivalence, not isomorphism. Where equivalence has multiple, uh, def can be defined in multiply equivalent ways, <laughs> um, but <laughs> the definition I'll give you is just this, that, that an isomorphism is when you have, um, so if you've got A and B, they're isomorphic if there's a function between them that has an inverse. Uh, and, a, and, sorry, a pre and post inverse. And the pre and post inverses are the same. Whereas for equivalence, you need the weaker requirement, that there is a pre inverse and there is a post inverse, but they needn't be the same. And this distinction only matters in a proof relevant context because it turns out that isomorphism is materially equivalent to equivalence. But isomorphism uh, is a so called, uh, is, is, is not a so called mere proposition in HOT, whereas equivalence is. And the reason you get inconsistency is because. <laughs> Once you've got univalence, you can prove of the thing that you put into univalence <coughs> that it is a mere proposition. But you could have previously proved that it wasn't a mere proposition, so now you've got contradiction. Whereas um, if you take equivalence, well, it's not a mere proposition, and then you can prove that it's not a mere proposition, so you're okay. So I just mentioned that because there's a lot of talk around about hot and isomorphism and univalence, and it's just you know, there are subtleties here that you need to be aware of. Um, 
I'm also very dubious about the claim that isomorphism is identity in mathematics. Um, and I'm a structuralist, right? But at least I think I am. But um, so, for example, I think an oh, easy counterexample, right? Uh, I've got the Euclidean three space, and then I take some plane E2, and I take some other plane E2, and those E2s are not the same, but they are isomorphic, so isomorphism isn't identity, right? Now, there may be some issue here about isomorphism between structures rather than isomorphism of substructures within a structure or whatever, but at least I think we should be very careful about the claim that isomorphism is identity as a sort of you know, oh, that's what structuralism says, and you know, we all know that, move on. You know, I think we need to think very carefully about that. Okay, so, um, so what equivalent, what, what, what univalence, the work univalence does, is that it allows you to have a function which will produce an identity from an equivalence. So you can always, without univalence, produce an equivalence from an identity but you can't necessarily do the reverse. Under univalence, you can. Um, now, Audi's argument in the paper in Philosophica Mathematica is an argument that you should believe that there is such a function. But univalence says something stronger than this. It says that this function is itself an equivalence. And Audi, by the way, doesn't give an argument for that extra bit of univalence. And that's an also, also an interesting and important subtlety. And that extra bit of univalence is what does lots of important work. So it really matters that it doesn't give you full univalence. In particular, one of the things you can prove under univalence is that functions that are extensionally equivalent <coughs> are identical, which you might think is a good thing um, to be able to know. right? Um, but you can only prove that using this. You can't prove it just from that. Okay, good. So, enough about, um, yeah, so this is the sort of formal statement that the equivalence between A and B, this type, is itself equivalent to the type of identities between A and B. That's what Univalence says. Okay, um, now, in the basic set of Hot, as I said before, Univalence is an axiom. Uh, that means it has to be added in separately. And because it's a proof-relevant system, then you kind of, every time you prove something univalence, you have to carry around a copy of your assertion of univalence with you. And so that means that um, there's a bit of a computational burden to univalence, much of, as there's an attraction to it. And so people are motivated to try and develop alternative theories that somehow build, hot, uh, build univalence into the guts. But that's not the situation of the theory as we have it now. Can I ask a clarification? Yeah, please. You use the word identifications? Yeah. And plural? Yeah, so the type of identity, well, the, it, a ter term of art, right? So the tokens, so more normally one might write id, a, b, okay? And then talk about p being an identification. So the tokens of the identity type of a and b are commonly known as identifications. But I mean, it, analogously to the tokens of the isomorphism type are isomorphisms. But in, isn't it isn't it right that in maybe more traditional approaches to logic, there would usually be one such token? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> and, and and the point about hot that makes it really interesting is that you can have multiple. Um, so, but the, the point is just that you know. So on the previous slide, when you were you were quoting Steve, uh, so. Uh, we have to be a little bit careful about the word isomorphism, but we also have to be a little bit careful about the word identity because we aren't we aren't just borrowing sort of our old. Okay, <coughs> so um, I have a paper um, forthcoming in Philosophy of Mathematica with Stuart on the question as to whether identity in Hoc should really be called identity, given that it has novel, uh, if not to say, you know, uh, revolutionary, revolutionary <laughs> uh, features. Um, compared to identity as we normally understand it. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the reason the issue arises is because, uh, as you will know, but others won't, um, if I think about uh, A and B, and I have some identification, 
um, then I can have another identification. And then I can ask the question whether those identifications are themselves equal. And they may not be, which is exactly what you're pointing to. Even if they are, I may be able to prove that they're equal in more than one way. And I can then ask of those identifications whether they themselves are equal, and so on and so on. <laughs> and so this is why um, Steve Alley's characterized it as a theory. Someone sort of said, oh, so it's identity all the way down. And he said, no, it's identity all the way up. Um, because there's, there's, there's no limit to the number of identity types that I can form. And I can always ask the further question whether two things that are ident two identifications are themselves identical at that next higher level. And this is the infinity groupoid structure of Hot. And one definition of Hot is it's any theory whose semantics um, is infinity groupoids. Um, you know, any theory that, that is a fact that is substantiated by infinity groupoids. An infinity groupoid, and you've got, I've got the chance to tell um, my favorite joke about Hot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of jokes. Uh, is, um, an infinity groupoid is a type whose identity types are in, whose identity type is an infinity groupoid. Okay. Was that the joke? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, a, it's, a, it's called a co-inductive definition. Um, okay. Good. So, um, let's talk about philosophy of physics. Uh, well, five minutes. Right? Um, it will it, be probably quite quick. So, we all know this. So, I'll just run through and then you can just tell me if I've said anything that isn't, isn't true. Um, general covariance, I've taken the same form in all coordinate systems. Um, perfectly possible to have uh, theories that, un uh, unlike general relativity, whose models aren't closed under diffeomorphism, but have their equations written in a generally covariant way. So the special thing about GR is that if you start with a model and then you get, uh, and then get a new model by, get a new structure by applying diffeomorphism, the new thing is guaranteed to also be a model which wouldn't be true in special relativity, even if you formulated special relativity in a generally covariant way. Okay, anyone happy with that? No. Tell me why. What do you mean by form? I mean, you write down the equations of the like theory the... In, a, in a way such that they're valid in all independent coordinate systems. But I mean, I mean just go from uh, an inertial frame to a non-inertial frame. You don't want that to be a counterexample. Because the, the equations take a different form. So you have pseudo forces on the In special relativity? Yeah. So does that mean you think you can't write special relativity in general covariant way? No, I, I just. I'm quibbling with this definition of general covariance. That's a big thing. Maybe we can that. Yeah, let's move on. I mean, okay, I, okay. I, I took the date, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'll take your point. All right. Um, so, what's a diffeomorphism? It's a smooth, continuously differentiable transformation between manifolds as a smooth inverse. Um, it's natural to think that uh, manifolds are only given up to diffeomorphism in the sense that, um, to the practicing mathematician, it wouldn't make any sense to distinguish between a manifold and another manifold that it was diffeomorphic with. At least if you consider them separately, right? I mean, if you just sort of stipulate that this manifold is numerically different to that manifold, then you can talk about diffeomorphism between these two distinct manifolds. But if I just give you them one at a time, <coughs> You couldn't tell which one I'd given you if they were diffeomorphic. And um, I think the reason for that is that basically um, the definition of a manifold involves the notion of an equivalence class of charts, and the relevant equivalence class is equivalent under diffeomorphism. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, 
Well, you all know that the diffeomorphism also induces a mapping on the fields. So if H is a diffeomorphism, then we induce an isometry between the metrics. Now, um, the, and that's the definition of an isometry. So, the issue that the, the basically, the, the, the people who want to deny that the whole argument kind of makes any mathematical sense think that the problem is with comparing what happens to G under the isometry in induced by the diffeomorphism when you haven't applied the diffeomorphism to N. So that when this talk of like, um, well, it's identical relative to this but not relative to that is, is, is what that's pointing to. The idea that somehow it's illegitimate to apply the diffeomorphism to G, but not to do it to M. And of course, if you apply the diffeomorphism to M, then the relevant thing to compare with the point P in M, in the, sorry, the point P in this model, is the image of P under H in this model. Right? And then you won't get any, uh, you know, dif any difference between the two models. So, insofar as the whole argument depends on applying a diffeomorphism or the, applying the isometry induced by the diffeomorphism to G but not applying the diffeomorphism to M, if you can show that you can't do that in HOT, then you would show that HOT blocks the whole argument. And um, I think it's true that I now think it's true that you can't do that in HOT. And um, the reason why is that HOT insists that everything be well typed and that when things are introduced, they are very precisely defined. And when we introduce functions like isometries, well, we're applying them to the metric. What is the metric? Well, the metric is the metric of M, and the only way to generate uh, an action on the metric is by applying it to the whole lot. That's basically what goes on. So I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Um, the crucial thing is not um, univalence at all. It's, uh, oh, sorry, this is just an old slide, so. Um, Yeah, so there's a very quick argument that says something like equivalence is identity, the models are equivalent, therefore they're identical, and then representation better represent better respect identity, therefore they represent the same thing, therefore they're whole. Right? That's too quick. And and in fact, you can without univalence you can still block the argument. And insofar as univalence blocks the argument, it only does it given that you're using this dependent pair construction I'll explain in a minute. And so it, it seems like univalence is neither necessary nor sufficient for blocking the whole argument. What is necessary and sufficient for blocking a whole argument is thinking of the manifold and the metric as a dependent pair. And if you think about it that way, then the only way you get to do something to the second bit of the dependent pair is by doing it to the whole thing. And then you, you're, you're not allowed to recombine, sort of to think of M being left alone but G being acted upon. So that's, that's, that's the long and the short thing. Um, so, how do dependent pairs work? You know, it's, we have an identification between X and Y, which are two tokens of some type. Then, given that we've got a predicate on X and a predicate on Y, then this identification automatically gives us a transport function that takes P, the token that says that X has property P, to an image that says that Y has property P. Now, in the case that we're interested in, um, we don't have 
this situation, we have this situation. So H is non-trivial identity of Z with itself. Okay, so what Z? Z is a token of the type Lorentzian manifolds. And application of H to Z is, while it's an identity, it's not the trivial identity. And that lives to give us uh, an action from G to an image of G, an isometric image of G. But the way that we were able to do that was because, I mean, we were only allowed to do that because we have this dependent pair construction. So, I mean, given that I've, I've run over time and I'm sure people want to um, discuss this, I'll just sort of come to my conclusion, I think. Um, so, what I'm going to say is, of course, many people won't bother by the whole argument in the first place. That's fine. Um, if you're doing things in hot and you assume that the right way to represent things is by a dependent pair, then you will not be allowed to generate the whole argument. Because there is no way to generate the action on G without applying, and generate a non-trivial action on G without doing something non-trivial to M as well. Right? Now, the question that I, last time I gave this talk in this room, I thought that, um, <laughs> that it was optional that you'd use the dependent pair construction. Right? And there would be nothing in hot to stop you using a, a more conventional construction. But I now think that's not true. In fact, this is the only way to do it in the hot that makes any sense. And so I now think that it is true that doing things in hot blocks the whole argument, uh, but that it doesn't depend on univalence. Um, univalence gets you for free that there's an, that then gives you an identification of mg that under univalence, mg will now be equal to m h star g. Because these are equivalent, and univalence gives you a function that gets you from an equivalence to an identity, and then you have an identity, and then if, 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 you, if you respect identity, <coughs> under you know, representations, respect identi representation relation respects identity, then they're going to have to represent the same world. Right? But you needn't impose univalence to think that. I mean, you get to say uh, how the representation relation works. And so if you want to say that given any structure, any, any structure that's equivalent to it represents the same world, then you get to say that. Right? So the application of univalence is not necessary. Now, um, I just have a note here about thinking about weak quotients, but I won't say anything more about that, but I just assert and don't think that works. Um, and then provoke a question perhaps by that. So, uh, so what's my conclusion? Right, so... The conclusion, you're just standing just at the, you've got 10 minutes for questions now. Yeah, okay. So, so uh, my conclusion is that hot allows you to block the whole argument by not allowing you to do things to the metric with an uh, isometry that's induced by a diffeomorphism that you didn't do to the base manifold. That it doesn't depend on univalence, and that you, insofar as you think that you ought to be able to formulate the whole argument, maybe that counts against hot. Um, but I'll stop there. Thanks.